I think in our Instagram world and Snapchat filters and where everything's polished and pretty, it's important to tell kids that you are who you are. And one morning you're going to wake up with a big pimple in the middle of your nose and life's going to go on. Hello and welcome to More Than Sunday, a weekly podcast where we take a deeper dive into the stories, themes, and questions of our faith. My name is Julie Richter and I'm the lead pastor to Access, our modern worship community here at First United Methodist Church Richardson. And with me every week is our worship director, Eric Chikowski. Hey, Eric, how's Hello. it going? I'm well as always. Can't Good. complain. Good. Yeah. So we're in a series right now where we're talking about labels. And the last couple of weeks, we've talked about economic labels and labels around mental illness or mental health. And this week, we are talking about physical labels, the labels that we put on one another based on our physical appearance. So what's really interesting to me is that physical labels, sexual labels are rampant in the way that we first identify someone, in what society and media and social media tell us should be important, tell us we should be placing our identity in. So it's consuming in us identifying our value, but at the same time, it's a really difficult conversation. People are shy about talking about some of these things or just don't really want to acknowledge the role that these labels play in our lives. And so we think it's a really important conversation, not only for us today, but for the church in general to be willing to speak into these kinds of topics. So we have a really great conversation today with Kim Myers. Kim is the Associate Pastor of Family Ministries at St. Andrew United Methodist Church, but she also teaches classes around human sexuality. And so we are thrilled to talk to her today about these labels around physical and sexual imagery, but also how we can come back and see our value as a child of God first and foremost. We are here with Reverend Kim Myers, and we are really excited to talk to you today about these labels that we put on people. Thank you so much for being here. I'm excited to be here. Can you give us just a little bit of context for your experience and your career? Would you mind telling us what you do in your ministry and how you got to where you are today? So is that going to be the whole podcast? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, when I was in kindergarten. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I went to VBS. <laughs> So I am now serving at St. Andrew United Methodist Church. I am currently the family pastor, but for the past five years, I've been the children's pastor. Before that, I was at a new church start. Before that, I ran a preschool. Before that, I was a teacher in a classroom. So you put all that together, and it creates the perfect job for me as family pastor. That's excellent. Yeah, working with all ages. All ages. Yeah, that's great. So tell us a little bit about the reasons that you spent several years teaching classes on human sexuality. What what were you teaching these students and parents, and, and why does that matter? I think first and foremost, if we don't teach it from the church, if we let that voice go to society, then we're saying nothing, and we're letting society form our children. And when it comes to human sexuality, I think the church should have a voice. But I also think that the curriculum that we used and the way we taught it was very scientific based. This is what's happening to your body. This is why it's happening to your body. But also we had like 42 Bible scriptures put in there. And essentially again and again and again, we told a child, you're exactly who you're created to be. And even if you're five foot three or six foot two, that's how God created you to be and live into that image. So it's not just on the sexuality components, but just helping kids become comfortable with who they are and reminding them of their identity as a creation. As a child of God. God. Child of God. Yeah. Yeah. Especially at an age when their body is changing so much too. So what age do you teach it at? So typically it's fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. So sometimes in that range, nothing's happening physically yet, Mm -hmm. right? But the emotions starting to happen and the hormones have started to go throughout the body to all the right body parts for the changes to happen. The other thing that I think is important through this class is this is an important part of growing up Mm -hmm. and everybody goes through this. And it's such a gift to grow into who you're supposed to be. 
you know, if you don't go through puberty, your life is much shorter and you can't live it out to the fullest where, you know, puberty and adolescence is a gift that is awkward sometimes, but it's one that even Jesus went through. Mm. You know, and that's one of the stories we talk about Jesus in the temple mm. proclaiming his adultness wow. and his separation from his parents. Yeah. No, I love that you talk about how many scriptures, 42, did you say? That's an somewhere, estimate. Yeah. Somewhere in there. Yeah. But yes. So over 40. Over 40. <laughs> yeah. Over 40 scriptures about how we are created in God's image and how our bodies are beautiful. And yet, I think you're right, Kim, that if we leave this up to other places besides the church, mm-hmm. that is a much different message and a much more shameful message so, that our children are hearing. Absolutely. One of the things we do... And it's getting harder and harder to do it because magazines are less abundant. But we do a montage, a male montage and a female montage of if you just landed on Earth, what does the magazine say a woman should be and what does the magazine say a man should be? And we talk about those stereotypes and how really you're created to be you, you know, and nothing you buy can make you more male or female than God created you to be. Mm. So that's something we say again and again and again. I think in our Instagram world and Snapchat filters and where everything's polished and pretty, it's important to tell kids that you are who you are. And one morning you're going to wake up with a big pimple in the middle of your nose and life's going to go on. Hashtag no filter. important thing to remember. No, yeah. it's true. Yeah. It's absolutely true. I yeah. mean, we don't have very many spaces now, especially because of filters and Instagram. And I was about to say MySpace. Oh, wow. Wow. She's old. She's old. <laughs> <laughs> the dial up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Snapchat that there's not many spaces for kids to not only be honest, but to just be themselves and for that imperfection or for that realness of who they are to be celebrated. Well, especially fifth, sixth, and seventh. I mean, do you oh, all yeah. remember middle school? Like I blocked it out. Yeah. I was a child of the 80s, so mm-hmm. I had the big bangs and the perm, and it was fabulous. <laughs> Not really. It was awful. <laughs> um, but for some reason, I was confident in who I was. I don't know why. I'm going to go with good parenting, good churching. But I had a good friend who just was always trying to do her hair this way or wear these clothes or make... And now, if my parents listened to this, I wanted Z Cavaricis more than anybody else in the world. It was going to make me the coolest person. (laughs) So I was not 100% immune to it. But I think the other statistic that we're living into is depression, anxiety, and fear. And if children can know, first and foremost, they're created by God before anything else, all of those statistics go down. Yeah. Not created in anxiety or depression or fear or even in appearance. Or, you know, you become now an expert Mm -hmm. at a young age. You start playing soccer at the age of four, and by the age of eight, you're in a select team that you sign for, right? You sign Mm -hmm. contracts for these select teams. What happens when you break your arm and you can't play the sport anymore? Mm -hmm. Then you've lost your identity. But if your identity's a child of God, that's just a piece of your personality and a part of your life. And I think that's something that I hope to instill in my kids. My kids are really active in several sports and they play in band. But if one of those things happened that they couldn't do, hopefully their identity in being a child of God is going to help them get through that in a way where you don't have that, then you have lost who you are. Absolutely. So we are in the midst of a series called Labels. Why do you think that labels exist? Why, why do we label people based on their physical appearance? Because it's easy. Mm. Right? I mean, it's instinct of who we are. We just look at somebody and we could say they're short, they're fat, they're tall, they have freckles. You know, it's just easy. Sadly, though, some labels are good and some labels are bad. But we use them across the board for everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and some of them, as we've talked about in other weeks as well, are just, they are what they are, right? They are our means of making sense of our world. And so as clear as our sight, when we see someone, we begin to 
not evaluate them per se, but we begin to say things in our minds like that person has glasses, that person is short, that person is tall, that person. And so I think that there's a point in which those labels go from an assessment to a judgment. Oh, totally. So where do you think that line is? I think in community. Hmm. You're assessing somebody when you're first meeting them. If you don't become their neighbor and their friend, then those assessments become judgments because you don't truly know them, right? They're only labels. Where if I use labels, right? If you're the fat, nerdy kid who is awkward socially, and that's all you are to that person. But once you become friends with them, then they're the hilarious friend that has the best stories and can help you with X, Y, and Z. The labels change into relationships and not visualizing them or judging them. Yeah, that's great. When I teach the baptism class at church, I talk about how we're putting on a new identity in Mm -hmm. Christ. So I have many labels in my life. I'm mom, I'm pastor, I'm sister, I'm friend. And wherever I'm at, you know, I might be called something else. Mm -hmm. But when you are Christian, that covers all of those. I'm a Christian in all. Yeah. You know, and I think that's what takes down those labels. And that's why the church teaching human sexuality is so important. Because it's important for them to know puberty, physical things that are happening. But it's also important for them to know in adolescence, you're going to be going through a lot. And you're not supposed to go through it alone. Mm. God put us here in community. He created Adam. Adam needed a partner. Adam needed somebody to do life with. We need somebody to do life with. And that's one thing we do talk a lot about in the class is who is your neighbor? God calls us to live in community, to be together, to love one another. Human sexuality is a gift to be used wisely, but that community changes everything in how we treat others. So how do you see Jesus talking about our bodies? You mentioned some of the scriptures. What are some of those positive scriptures around body image or around some other things? So I'm going to take it a little different slant. Okay. I think Jesus always talks about the body of God, that we are meant and created to work together in one community and one accord. When I think about how Jesus talks about body, he heals our bodies several times in the scripture, Right. But it's so that that person can become a part of the community. The lepers, those who were blind, those who were deaf, they were outcast. And so I go back to the messages of the body of Christ and living into the eyes can't do what the ears can do. And so if we grow into that faith community, we're stronger with each separate, different, skilled person. No, I think that's so true. I was reading a quote and then a piece of a sermon this last week around how our salvation cannot just be in our head because the gospel is so physical and our salvation even is so physical because when we talk about the body of Christ, what we're talking about is God creating God's self in our image and then taking that image, that humanness and letting it by the world standards, be ripped apart in shame and in violence in the worst way possible. And then God saying redemption. Absolutely. And so how can our salvation not be about the physical body of Christ? Right. Good Friday is one of my favorite services. Yeah, me too. Because it reminds me that God was broken. And so Mm. on my worst days, I know God is next to me fully. Yeah. Fully. So we talked about some of those positive scriptures. I think that our scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, but I'd say in the New as well, don't always portray individuals with a dignity around their body. Can you think of some of those that we see more of a negative body image or somebody whose body is being taken advantage of as an object in scripture? Well, I always go back to one of the scriptures talks about what not to do. Mm. Well, many of them talk about that, but... Don't look at outward signs. Mm -hmm. What you wear isn't going to matter, but who you put on. You put on the body of Christ. That's going to transform how you see others, how you view others. The body in the Bible is very black and white. Either Mm. it works and it's good or it's broken and it's bad. And I feel like 
for example, the woman at the well. She was shunned. She had lived a lifestyle that was not great in that day and age, probably still would be judged today for that. And instead of Jesus shunning her, he gives her living water. Mm. He transforms her life so that she can then be a part of a big community because she has gifts and skills for that community. And I think sometimes, again, that's where we stop, right? We just see the labels. We see the hooker at the well who you don't want to be associated with. And to live into what God has called us to do, not only do you need to be associated with her, but you need to make her your neighbor and your friend. Yeah. And look beyond that name, right? Yeah, that label. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. So do you have a story of a time when you saw a label put on somebody? And if so, how did it affect that person and did it affect you in any way? I mean, I have like 14,000 stories about yeah. that, especially I was a special ed teacher. Mm. So not only do you use labels, but they're on paperwork, right? You check the boxes of all the labels that you place on a child. And so I saw that a lot, especially when I taught the deaf. Just that one hearing impaired box meant they weren't smart and meant they couldn't understand things. Instead of saying, I'm sure they're brilliant. We just need to teach them in a different way, and they might need to communicate in a different way so that they can expound their knowledge in a different way. So there's that kind of thing. I had friends in high school, maybe myself, who went kind of the gothic fun route. <laughs> the fun route. Uh-huh. <laughs> the gothic fun route. Uh-huh. As That's my the parents, first time I've ever heard those two yeah, words together. Yeah, my right. parents called it the dark side. Um, <laughs> but just putting that label the goth girl Mm. on somebody that automatically means I'm high, I sleep around, I listen to this kind of music. You know, the fact that I went to church every Sunday, and I'm not saying I didn't make stupid choices. I did. But it was a certain label that went around that, you know. But even the label of a gifted child is a quote-unquote good label, But it comes with a battery of expectations that come along with it. And so I think just labels per se just come with so much baggage that you have to carry with you at all times. Now that I'm an official reverend, that title and label, people act different around me Mm -hmm. than they used to. And I'm still created by God, which means I'm human, Mm -hmm. which means I'm imperfect. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier, Kim, that the church is uniquely positioned and maybe even has the responsibility to speak to our children around human sexuality and maybe as well as our teens and our young adults and our adults and our older adults, all ages. I think the church is uniquely positioned to speak about human sexuality. What are some things that you hope that the church will say in those regards? I hope I hope so many things. I hope we stop damaging children with their bodies, Mm. that instead of blaming them for how they grow up or choices that they make, that we might hold them accountable for who they are, but we truly love them through it instead of shaming them through it. That's good. So for someone struggling, what are some things we individually can say or do that help someone's life? As a Christian, I think it's important to say that Jesus is bigger than that. Jesus is bigger than all your problems. Now, what does that really mean? To say that to a kid who's struggling, they might just run out of the room, right? Mm -hmm. So to sit and say, I understand. I hear you. How can I help you? Not what you're doing is okay, or your struggles are fake, or just to listen and to be present If our churches could truly be a place of refuge from society instead of place that's fighting with society, I think that would be an ideal world for me. That reminds me of a guest we had a few weeks ago on the podcast who also named Kim, who was talking about the work that she does in Richardson ISD and how one of the mantras that she lives by when being in a relationship with students and with people is, do they see me? Do they hear me? And does what I say matter? Right. And it just reminded me as you were talking through just really being present with them and making sure that they know that they're being heard. Well, and I'm also of the mantra of I'm sick of people saying 
oh, it used to be better when, or, oh, the world is so horrible now today. Have you read the Old Testament? (laughs) We have always been damaged and made mistakes and made society this horrible place of craziness. That is not new. So how do we embrace people, hold people accountable, but love them through it and not judge them through it? So, Kim, we have one question that we ask everyone who comes on the podcast, uh-huh. and that question is, at this point in your life, what's one thing that you wish somebody would have told you? I knew you were going to ask this, so I feel like I should have a really great answer. <laughs> she told us beforehand <laughs> that she listens yeah, to the podcast. Yeah, yeah. and I'm, now I'm, like, blanking. <laughs> you know, I wish somebody would tell me that being who I am is enough. Because I still struggle with that. I think we all struggle with that. That who I am is enough. It may not always be perfect, but it's it's enough. That's great. I don't think we can hear that too many times. I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kim, you are such a joy in my life personally, but also to our conference and, of course, to St. Andrew as their associate pastor. And so thank you for coming on today and helping us to wipe away some of these labels, clarify where we can be doing better and what it really means to love your neighbor. We really appreciate it. Thank you. So after we stopped recording, Kim and I continued talking. And one of the things that she mentioned was that one of our biggest struggles as humans is to see other people as humans rather than as objects. That one of the things that they teach in these human sexuality classes is that people are people. And so how we speak to one another, what we say about one another, the words and even the physical expressions that we give to one another, we are constantly called back to that question, are we treating people like humans or like objects? And maybe more specifically for us as Christians, are we treating them as children of God? And so we want to leave you this week with the scripture passage that Julie referenced briefly in her sermon on Sunday. This is 1 Corinthians 6 verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of More Than Sunday. We've got a new episode coming out every Wednesday, so make sure and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or YouTube so you don't miss our next episode. If you want to find out more about the Access community here at First United Methodist Church Richardson, you can find us online at accessfumcr.com, as well as on Facebook and Instagram. Special thanks to Kim Myers for joining us this week. And make sure and tune in next Wednesday when we have a conversation with Bart Patton about social labels. Have a great week.